Mr. Shapiro, you talked about white privilege. And um, just this week, I had a conversation with Rachel Lazar, who's done some work, um, a Jewish um, American woman who's done some work on this area, as well as uh, having extensive conversations um, with Dr. Greg Parks of Wake Forest University, who's also talked quite a bit about um, critical race theory. Um, and it's, it's my understanding that white privilege is not telling individuals that they cannot speak, but it is a term for societal privilege that individuals have as a benefit of their white skin. Um, and I don't think that, um, and I think universities would be remiss to then say that because you're white, you're not allowed to say anything that's critical of white people. I didn't know that white privilege actually went into that sphere. My understanding is it's just, and the issue is, is that white privilege makes people uncomfortable to talk about the societal privilege that they have. Well, it, to, to me, the, what I say on campuses all the time is if you want to cite instances of racism that we can all find and fight together, that's something that I'm more than willing to stand next to you and fight because that's obviously stuff that we should fight together. But when you just say that there is a white privilege out there in the ether and that by dint of birth your skin color generates for you an advantage, what you're really saying to people is that you, your view is less valuable because you have not experienced what I've experienced. And that is an identity argument, that's a character argument, that's not a rational political argument that can actually be, be taken on in any way. That's, that's, it's, more of a, it's more of a cudgel in a club than it is an attempt to open a discussion. Well, I think it's a um, demonstrable evidence that um, through society's demographics that um, being white has societal privileges that being black does not. But I well, we, we am can talk very about interested. how that manifests because that's I'm also interested in what you just said now was that you would stand next to anyone who has this. So Mr. Shapiro, my question to you is, um, for Ms. Ms. Dumston, the tying the noose around the campus and writing messages that target African-American young students, would you consider that hate speech and then would you stand next to her and fight for her? As I say, I would, it, it, this is the first time I'm hearing about it, honestly, but... It, really? What, yeah, um, but, but from, from hearing about, it, maybe it's, it's local, I mean, I'm from L.A., um, but in any case, um, I'm more than happy, more than happy to, to stand alongside her and, and fight whatever group was responsible for this. Not, not only more than happy, I mean, you're talking about the alt-right. Again, I was the number one target of anti-Semitic harassment from the alt-right last year. Thank so you. I'm more than happy to do all that. And I, I think there's one more distinction that has to be made. When we talk about cases like, like Taylor's, they're horrific, and the administration is siding with Taylor. Okay, the administration is doing the right thing by Taylor, or trying to do the right thing by Taylor, as they should be. And I think that we need to make a distinction between cases where the administration is actively participating in the suppression of speech and cases in which the administration is trying to do the right thing as a, as in, order to, in order to make people, in order to punish people for uh, application of crime. It's an honor to testify before you here today. The reason that I'm with you is that I speak on dozens of college campuses every year, so I have some firsthand experience with the anti-First Amendment activities that have been taking place on, on the college campuses. I've encountered anti-free speech measures, administrative cowardice, even physical violence at campuses ranging from California State University at Los Angeles to University of Wisconsin at Madison, which is driving the legislation uh, that Ms. Demings was talking about, uh, to Penn State University to UC Berkeley, and I am not alone. In order to understand what's been going on at some of our college campuses, it's necessary to explore the ideology that provides the impetus for a lot of the protesters who violently obstruct events, pull fire alarms, assault professors and even other students, and the impetus for administrators who all too often humor these protesters. Free speech is under assault because of a three-step argument made by the advocates and justifiers of violence. The first step is they say that the validity or invalidity of an argument can be judged solely by the ethnic, sexual, racial, or cultural identity of the person making the argument. The second step is that they claim those who say otherwise are engaging in what they call verbal violence. And the final step is they conclude that physical violence is sometimes justified in order to stop such verbal violence. So let's examine each of these three steps in turn. First, the philosophy of intersectionality. This philosophy now dominates college campuses as well as a large segment, unfortunately, of today's Democratic Party and suggests that straight white Americans are inherently the beneficiaries of white privilege and therefore cannot speak on certain policies since they have not experienced what it's like to be black or Hispanic or gay or transgender or a woman. This philosophy ranks the value of a view not based on the logic or merit of the view, but on the level of victimization in American society experienced by the person espousing the view. Therefore, if you're an LGBT black woman, your view of American society is automatically more valuable than that of a straight white male. The next step in the logic is obvious. 
If a straight white male or anybody else who ranks lower on the victimhood scale says something contrary to the viewpoint of the higher ranking intersectional, intersectionality identity, that person has engaged in a microaggression. As NYU social psychologist Jonathan Haidt writes, microaggressions are small actions or word choices that seem on their face to have no malicious intent, but that are thought of as a kind of violence nonetheless. You don't have to actively say anything insulting to microaggress. Somebody merely needs to take offense. If, for example, you say that society ought to be colorblind, you're microaggressing certain identity groups who have been victimized by a non-colorblind society. Note, microaggressions, as the name suggests, are not merely insults. They are aggressions. They are the equivalent to physical violence. Just two weeks ago, psychologist Lisa Feldman Barrett of Northeastern University published an essay in the New York Times suggesting that words should be seen as physical violence because they can cause stress, and stress causes physical harm. Thus, Feldman suggested it is reasonable, scientifically speaking, to ban or restrict speech you do not like at your school. This is both inane and dangerous. That's because it leads to the final logical step. Words you don't like deserve to be fought physically. When I spoke at California State University of LA, one professor threatened students who sponsored me by offering to fight them. He then posted a slogan on the door of his office stating, the best response to microaggression is macroaggression. As Haidt writes, this is why the idea that speech is violence is so dangerous. It tells the members of a generation already beset by anxiety and depression that the world is a far more violent and threatening place than it really is. It tells them that words, ideas, speakers can literally kill them. Even worse, at a time of rapidly rising political polarization in the United States, it helps a small subset of that generation justify political violence. Indeed, protesters all too often engage in physically violent disruption when they believe their identity group is under verbal attack by someone, usually conservative, but not always. Not only do some administrators look the other way, at Middlebury College, Cal State LA, Berkeley, Evergreen, actual crimes were committed and almost nobody has been arrested but they actively forbid events from moving forward, creating a heckler's veto. The notion that if you are physically violent enough, you can get administrators to kowtow to you, to bow before you, by canceling an event you disagree with altogether. All of this destroys free speech. But just as importantly, it turns students into snow, snowflakes, craven and pathetic, looking for an excuse to be offended so they can earn points in the intersectionality Olympics and then use those points as a club with which to beat opponents. A healthy nation requires an emotionally and intellectually vigorous population ready to engage in open debate at all times. Shielding college students from opposing viewpoints makes them simultaneously weaker and more dangerous. We must fight that process at every step. And that begins by acknowledging that whatever we think about America and where we stand, we must agree on this fundamental principle. All of our views should be judged on their merits, not on the color or sex or sexual orientation of the speaker, and those views should never be banned on the grounds that they offend someone. Thanks so much. Mr. Shapiro, would the, the professors you cited in your testimony view your four minute and 48 second opening statement as a microaggression? <laughs> I assume that some of them would. I mean, it, the, apparently college students do all the time. Since when I speak there, I've been, I think there have been riots and such. I think they definitely will, which is kind of a sign of the times. Like